Hello everybody, today we're looking at a blast from the past. I like to say that the late 90s and early 2000s were sort of the golden age for film, but that might just be because of my age group. Nevertheless, we're gonna put our remembering caps on, and go back to a time where the phrase, male chauvinist pig actually meant something. Back when accusations of sexual harassment were taken seriously outside of Hollywood, rather than just shrugged off because the feminist played Boy Who Cried Wolf with it too many times. We're looking at a movie from a year before the towers fell, this is What Women Want, starring Mel Gibson, that came out in the year 2000. And our protagonist, boy oh boy, he is not just a feminist trope from the post-Obama years, he is a genuine male chauvinist pig. And the writers really did everything they could to drive this home. The movie opens up talking about his childhood growing up in Las Vegas, surrounded by, ahem, great examples for both male and female role models. And the narrator's voice during that section is actually his ex-wife, who we soon find out is going on her honeymoon with her new husband. And she's planning to leave their 15-year-old daughter in Nick Marshall's care for two weeks. More on that later. During the opening, the film follows Nick through a day in the life. We see him waking up, sexually harassing his maid, slapping her ass, going to work, telling off-color jokes, being a nuisance to all the female employees, and oh, by the way, where does he work? Well, where would a character like this work? Do you know? Do you remember back when it was a big deal that the magazines and the ad corporations used to Photoshop bikini models, and the feminists at the time claimed that they were giving girls unrealistic beauty standards? Well, that, my friends, is the place where Nick Marshall works. His company has a problem, though. They are facing a shifting demographic market. That's right, my friends. This movie has the trope of throwing polar opposites in with each other. The department of the ad company, where this male chauvinist pig works, now needs to shift their focus and learn how to market to the 18 to 24 year old female demographic. And to help do this, his boss, side note by the way, it actually took me a few scenes to notice that the boss was none other than Hawkeye from MASH, albeit a little aged. I was actually watching this movie with my certified Zoomer GF, found out she does not know what MASH is, but you need not fear, I will rectify that soon. But to solve this demographic problem, and to shift the company's focus, Nick's boss brings in a new employee, a new manager for the department, Darcy McGuire, who has a reputation as being a hard, cold, unapproachable, unlikable boss lady. And honestly, if I had one criticism for this movie, I just don't think that she had the look for it. They cast her and made her appearance up like someone who's younger than the character probably was and more attractive than someone of that age and position in real life is likely to be. It didn't really sink in that she was supposed to be the whole office bitch stereotype until pretty late in the film, actually. And once I realized that, it actually got me thinking. That sort of typecast role in that era, I suppose that's closer than anything to the classic femme fatale type character that we used to see in the older movies. But back to the plot, Nick the male chauvinist pig now has to deal with a 15-year-old daughter living at home for two weeks, and a new hard-ass female manager at work, kicking the department into overdrive focusing on a new female market. His life, it appears, is getting turned a little bit upside down. Now for his first assignment at work, everybody in the department is given a pink box full of female beauty products products and told to go home, pick one that inspires them, and create an ad pitch for it. Because, you know, they're learning to pitch ads to the young female demographic. So we see this macho chauvinist men's men character, played by Mel Gibson, going home, playing Frank Sinatra, dancing around, getting wine drunk, popping in one of his daughter's pop music CDs, and then, you know, using exfoliating skin products, waxing his legs, trying on pantyhose, putting on nail polish. And remember, this was back during a time when this was still weird. So at, at the time, this was funny. This was a joke. And so it's humorous when the daughter and her boyfriend walk in and catch him in the bathroom doing that. But after that happens, though, after the daughter and the boyfriend leave, Nick is seen slipping and falling into a bathtub full of water while holding a hairdryer. He gets electrocuted. He wakes up the next morning and suddenly he can hear women's thoughts. So he goes around and he starts noticing just what women think of him. They hate his jokes, they think he's rude and disgusting, they feel completely ignored by him, which up until now they have been. He's been mistreating his overqualified secretary, pretty much abusing his maid, completely ignoring the quiet office girl whose only job appears to be delivering files to people's desks, and making a fool out of himself with a lot of his proposals in front of Darcy and the rest of his department. So we get a few scenes of him trying to make a good proposal to Darcy and the department, failing spectacularly. On day two of hearing women's thoughts, he's sort of freaking out a little, so he contacts who else but the female middle-aged marriage counselor who helped him back when him and his ex-wife were going through hard times. And this meeting with that counselor becomes one of the pivotal plot-defining points of that movie. She advises him 
to use his gift to his advantage, to learn what women want, to finally answer, as she puts it, the question that Freud died never having answered. So then we see him going around and starting to make some changes in his life, starting to make some changes with the way that he treats the women around him. That underpaid, overqualified secretary, he starts to treat her better. I thought that particular character was a little bit poorly done, I think, because she's portrayed as working minimum wage despite having an Ivy League education. Now, if, if you were one of the people writing this film, you would put her plot development as being promoted to a higher position in the department, right? You would have her being given more important work. No, 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 that's not what they do with her. Instead, when the plot comes full circle, early on she mentions that she spends work time spending hours long on the phone with her boyfriend in Israel. And instead of giving her a promotion, or more important work, or even a raise, Nick Marshall allows her to call the boyfriend with his blessing, and eventually the boyfriend moves up here. There's a scene where he's, like, gossiping with a bunch of the girls in the office, including her, and giving her relationship advice with him. I just thought that was a weird development of the movie. If I were one of the people writing this, I would have chosen something different to do with that character. But anyway, the, the invisible girl that he mentions, the one that delivers files, there's a scene where she drops a bunch of things she was carrying, and Nick is the only one that stops to help her pick the stuff up. There's a girl who works at a coffee shop that he visits every morning, flirts with her much more effectively. Effectively. Talks to the new girl in the office more effectively, Darcy, his new manager, and they start to have chemistry pretty early on. And then to top it all off that night when he gets home, his daughter and some of her friends are at the house, and he offers to go shopping for a prom dress with the daughter, which earns him a lot of brownie points with the daughter's friends. There's sort of a middle point in the movie where we see him successfully gain the trust of the untrusting coffee shop chick, go back to her place, get her in bed, and in one way this move is the character back to his old self, using his ability to hear women's thoughts just to get in their pants, just going after one thing and one thing only after gaining their trust. But on the other hand, this scene is pretty humorous, and I don't think I would have cut this one out if given the chance if I was one of the people writing this. Because of the humor value, and they do keep it PG-13, by the way, but because the scene illustrates how he's able to hear what she's thinking and respond in the bedroom in real time. But after this, we get a few more scenes of Nick doing general self-improvement. He tells better jokes at work, not sexist jokes, but more on-color jokes. Or rather, more jokes that are self-deprecating to men rather than women. I mentioned before he has better conversations with his secretary, and he does much better in coming up with ideas for Darcy. In fact, this is because he can hear Darcy's thoughts, and pretty much all he does is say exactly what she's thinking before she has a chance to actually say it out loud with her mouth, only with her brain. And there's another scene of note. Him and Darcy are alone in the office, and they have a conversation. She confesses to him that she heard the exact kind of reputation he has, which is pretty much the kind of guy he was before he started being able to hear women's thoughts. And he confesses to her, too, that he heard she had a reputation for being frankly, a bitch. And closely after that, there's another scene where we see him leaving work very late at night, I think they say it's 10 p.m., and he finds that Darcy is the only one still in the office. So he peeks in her office, realizes she's lonely, she wants company to work with, stays late with her. We see them having even more chemistry. And it's at this point that I want to comment how much I appreciate their decision to have the soundtrack all or mostly Frank Sinatra. They played Mac the Knife more than once, which I did not fault them for. I absolutely love that song. They played I Won't Dance, Don't Ask Me. I don't know if they just had trouble getting music rights from any other musician, but either way, I don't think it's a bad choice at all. We see both Frank and Darcy enjoying Frank Sinatra, just at various times throughout the movie. Whenever they listen to music, it happens to be Frank Sinatra. I think if you were making a movie today, having a soundtrack like that would be a big risk, but in the year 2000, I don't think it was as big a risk, and I think it paid off. Now, after that working late scene, we get to see a scene where Nick actually takes his daughter out prom dress shopping, and after the whole montage of the daughter trying on different dresses, he takes her to a diner, and they have a conversation, and he tries to give her the sex talk, you know? Because uh, the boyfriend is a few years older, and he is getting a little handsy, and he at first didn't approve of that relationship for those reasons. And the daughter's like, Dad, I know, Mom already had this talk with me when I was 12, and sort of expresses contempt for him finally, after all this time, finally starting to act like a father. And we see him getting embarrassed at the diner, and we can hear the thoughts of the women around him listening in on this conversation and also being embarrassed for him. After this scene, Nick and Darcy actually do go on a date, and they actually do kiss quite a bit. And then, funny enough, immediately after the date, while he's walking home, in the middle of the night, he runs into that coffee shop girl, 
and she asks him, where have you been? You haven't even been getting coffee. You completely ghosted me after having sex with me. And of course, that was a big deal to her because part of how he gains her trust was telling her that he won't hurt her. They need to take it slow. He knows it's hard getting into a new relationship. And then he sleeps with her and then that happens. And funny enough, during that conversation, she asks him if he's gay. And he can hear in her thoughts that the correct answer is actually yes, because if she thinks he's straight, then she thinks she's just being rejected, unattractive. So he tells her, yeah, he, he's gay, he's very gay, and then he never sees her again. Very nice, Nick Marshall. Now, at work, they're getting close to the point of the movie where they present their big sales pitch to the corporation that's hiring them to produce an ad. One of the most important things their department of that company is going to be doing probably all year. And shortly before that meeting, Nick passes that quiet file delivery girl in the office again, and the things she's thinking tell him that she's actually very, very close to committing suicide, and she's planning to seriously attempt it in the very near future. But genius that he is, Nick avoids that and pushes it off for one more day, instead going into the presentation for Nike. He presents the ad while Darcy just sits there quietly. It goes well, they love it, and then later that night Darcy takes him to visit the new apartment that she bought, and they kiss there again. Now the next day at work is where we start getting the climax of the movie. Nick has a meeting with his boss. The boss tells him he made a mistake in hiring Darcy. He should have known he had the best advertiser right here all along. And you know, as a matter of fact, Nick, you're getting a promotion, and Darcy, she's fired. And then Nick tells the boss, oh no, 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 you made a mistake. She gets all the credit. What are you talking about? You did all the talking at that presentation. No, no, all the ideas were hers. Nick convinces the boss to talk to the board and get Darcy her job back. Meanwhile, they realize that the suicidal girl is not at work today. So in the middle of the drama of trying to figure out where Darcy is to tell her she has her job back, Nick is meanwhile looking up the home address of this girl, realizes she lives in a pretty crummy apartment in Chinatown. So he goes there to try and stop her before she does, you know, it. And he gets out of the taxi, gets directions, he goes down an alleyway, in the rain, in a storm, and while he's walking down that alleyway, lightning strikes one of the electric transformers above him, and we see some sparks fall on him. He doesn't appear to be hurt at the time, though, so he goes inside her apartment. He finds her suicide note, actually, before he finds her. Finds her, startles her a lot, and pretty quickly he realizes he can no longer hear what she's thinking. So now he has to talk this girl out of suicide without the benefit of being able to hear her thoughts. And he actually does it by offering her, not the secretary, he offers this girl more meaningful work at the company, and just showing her that she is noticed. And he mentions the reason that he came to her apartment to find her is because he just sort of sensed that she might do something to hurt herself, and of course she takes that as a huge compliment. She's actually being noticed because she never felt noticed at work before. So that scene wraps up in a pretty great way. The next scene is the daughter calls the mom from the prom, and she's pretty upset crying to the mom, so the mom calls the dad, and the dad drives to the prom to figure out where the daughter is, finds her crying in the bathroom. She tells the dad that she promised the boyfriend she would have sex with him after prom, but then in the middle of the dance floor when they were dancing, she had second thoughts about it and told him, and he says, oh, what a waste, I shouldn't have dated someone so young, and then he goes back to his ex-girlfriend right there in the middle of prom. So Nick Marshall talks to the daughter, makes her feel a whole lot better about herself, and then he drives her home. And now, meanwhile, what do you know, they still haven't found Darcy to tell her that she has her job back. So Nick goes over to her apartment in the middle of the night, and comes sort of clean. He didn't come clean about being able to read her thoughts literally, but he came clean about the fact that he was using her ideas to advance himself at work. And they have sort of a heartwarming reconciliation moment where she fires him. But they end up kissing. They confess their love to each other. Aww. The end which is, I think, a pretty hilarious ending because he ends up jobless, but that's just okay, I guess. I mean, I would have thought that's something that needed to be resolved, but, you know, such is life, such are movies. Now, what I thought overall about this movie, very good. There's not super a lot to go into and analyze about it. I wouldn't say I'm drawn to extract deeper meaning from any part of this movie, but it's a simpler relic from a simpler time. It's something where you can just sit back and relax and enjoy a good piece of media. And something I want to compare this to, actually, is a movie starring Jack Black called Shallow Hal, where Hal, the protagonist, played by Jack Black, is a guy who judges women by their appearance only, and he gets a similar sort of magical 
physiological change to his mind that prevents him from seeing women's actual appearance. Instead, they appear either attractive or unattractive based on only their personality. So it's, it's definitely a comedy how it ends up dating a super fat chick, but he doesn't even realize it because she has a great personality and he sees just a stunning 10 out of 10 blonde, and that's who he thinks he's dating. But then later on in the movie, when he loses that change in perception, he realizes she is an absolute land whale. So that's a similar feeling movie that I will compare this to. And in conclusion, my bona fide Zoomer GF thought it was very important that I make sure all of you know exactly what women want. Women want a prom dress and Nike shoes, and they want their dad to order pizza for their friends, and they want to call their boyfriend in Israel, and they want an apartment in Chinatown. That is what women want. The end.